bar of lead is placed in a machine that squeezes it so hard it comes out in the form of a thin rope. It's the core of the bullet. The leaden rope is cut into exact bullet lengths and shaped into exact bullet shapes. Then... Today I wanted to visit my good friend Nick who owns Nielsen Specialty Ammo. I wanted to stop by, show you guys his facility and I needed to get my air tank filled. And so we're just going to hang out here for a little bit and see what he's got going on. Let's go inside. So Nick, I really appreciate you giving me a tour of your shop. This is a really cool place. And yeah, thanks. I had no idea that there was this much involved in making bullets. Yeah. What has kind of changed for you over the past couple of years since you started making ammo? Yeah, ma mainly automation. So um, you know, this is the original machine I started with right here. Um, I, I have three of them now, but uh, these are pretty slow process. We still do our big bore um, on these machines. So uh, usually these three, all three machines will be running all day long. Um, but moving into the high-speed press, of course, is kind of the, the wave of the future for us. We have another one on order, actually. There's a second one will be here probably oh, springtime of 2020. Um, we will still be using these, uh, making our big bore, because we can't make everything on the high-speed press. It just doesn't have the same capability. This is a little bit more flexible, but way slower. But I would say automation is number one. Uh, a lot of testing with new guns that are coming out. We've been working with... Uh, lots of different manufacturers. I uh, can't talk about what we're doing with them, but um, in 2020, you're going to see more guns shooting more slugs, and a lot of them have chosen NSA to be a part of that uh, that testing and and be involved in what's going to be coming out in the uh, upcoming years. All right, so this is the wire we use for making our slugs and our uh, automated machine. We buy this in spools. These spools, they're about 150 pounds. And depending on what caliber it is, how big of a bullet, we're gonna get maybe around 25 or 30,000 bullets out of, a, out of a spool if it's a small caliber. So 22 caliber wire. Uh, we will change that depending on uh, what we're making to a, a, a thicker wire. Uh, this is uh, 168 thousandths diameter. So as far as diameter, um, like this is 222 diameter. So this is a little bit bigger diameter. This is what we use to make 25 caliber. I don't know if the camera will pick this up, but this is a little bit bigger diameter uh, wire that's on here. So this is 168 diameter. This is 222 diameter. And this would be making 25 caliber. This makes 22 caliber. When we go into uh, 30 caliber, we go into an even uh, bigger diameter, which is uh, 264 thousandths. And when we get to the machine, we'll show you what that does and, and why that matters. Uh, but basically, you have to have a certain diameter to go into the, um, into the die, because if it's too small, it'll go down and it'll snap your hollow point pin. So you can't use too small of a diameter. And if you use too big of a diameter, when it goes into the die, it won't fill out properly. So there's a balance in there. And it takes a, a little bit of computing to make sure, a little bit of experimentation to make sure that you got something that will uh, work on both ends, not too big not, and not too small. Uh, so we have different, different size wires depending on what caliber it is. And as we increase what calibers we're putting on our high-speed machine, we have to buy new lead wire uh, for those, all those different calibers on there. So this is our casting machine. The uh, machine takes cold lead, melts it. Uh, right now we've got it set at 782 degrees. And this is going to turn the molten lead into these blanks that we use to make bullets. This is uh, what we use to make our 290 grain uh, 45 caliber. That's what this blank is for. And basically what it's gonna do is just pour into a mold that's shaped like this on the inside. It's going to solidify, cool, and it's going to have cut sprues on one side and finished bullets, or in this case, blanks on the other side. Uh, once he's cool, this is what we put into our uh, Corbin swage machine and turn this into a bullet. And we'll show you that process of how, what we do. We take this, put it into a die, and it presses out a bullet. These are actually a little bit bigger than the finished uh, bullet. So if we're making a, say a 290 grain bullet, we're gonna use something that's maybe 300, 310 grains, 
and it's going to bleed off the excess. We'll show that process here in one of our machines. Okay, so this is our Corbin Swage machine. We actually have three of these machines. Um, we have two in another building that we have uh, down the way here. This one we use for while we're casting blanks. The person casting can also be making these. Uh, we're going to take this right here. So this is a blank that came out of our cast machine. And we're going to put this in into the die. So this is a 45 caliber die. We're going to make a 240 grain bullet. So anybody that shoots our 240 grain 457, uh, probably out of a Texan SS, this is the bullet we're making. And this is how that works. So that blank went into the die. It gets pressed in. You see excess lead coming in. That's how it comes out. It's got the hollow point and a dish base on the back. And an operator would sit here. You're going to see this lead moving out. And that lead popping out is because this blank weighs more than the finished bullet. And so this, this always stops at this plate right here. It always stops at the same plates. Once it reaches a certain pressure that we set, it then reverses. And that's how we get the same exact bullet every time, is that this stops at the same exact place. So they're always the same length. And then because the uh, weight of the lead is the same, obviously, and it bleeds out the excess, you don't get any variation in weight or very, very small amount. And we're going to demonstrate that to you with the three bullets that we just made. We're going to put them on the scale and show you how close in weight they stay. So this is our 240 grain bullet. Texas SS would be the most common gun that shoots this bullet. Very common for, for deer hunting. And you can see these are the three bullets we just made. And they will stay very, very consistent in weight. They're all the same. And this bullet is very consistent, not only in, in weight, but also in consistency of, the, of its shape. So the bullet would be very accurate in your gun because not only are they very consistent in weight, they're also very consistent in their shape. So there's no uh, edges that are, are rounded over like you get with cast bullets. There's all sharp edges. Everything is compressed with cold lead and pushed into a die and excess lead bled out the sides and it makes a very, very consistent bullet in shape and weight. So I'm going to show you kind of an example of how swaging process really works. So you have, basically you have three components. Um, now this is in a hand swage system. Uh, this is in my Corbin system like I have behind me. This is your top, uh, top punch and your bottom punch and your die. So the die screws into the machine and it has the shape of the bullet inside of here and then it has bleed holes on the sides. So excess lead comes out of these bleed holes. That's what these little wires are right here. That's excess lead. That's more weight than needed for that bullet. And so this particular die has three bleed holes. So what happens is this punch goes inside of here and it is set to, let's say it be around, around there where it's at the bottom of the die of where the nose is, and this comes down and it makes the base of the, of the bullet. So these two things are coming together with the lead in between, and they stop at the exact same place. We, we kind of showed that to you earlier, where they, where they stop at the same place and it reverses. And then the excess lead comes out the side of those holes. And then when the machine goes back down, when the ram comes down, the bullet is sitting on top of this, and that's what pushes it off, and then we pull the bullet off of there. This would not make a hollow point. Um, this is a different little, little different process. This would be making a, um, a, what they call a cup base. And depending on what we put on the other end of it, for example, this right here would make what's called a 1E nose. And so we have a lot of tooling to make a lot of different bullets. Not everything's on our site just because we can't offer everything under the sun, but we have a lot of capability to make a lot of custom bullets. And that's what this would do. This could make lots of custom bullets with lots of different weights. And we adjust that weight by how far this top punch goes inside the die. So the further we push it down, the smaller the bullet and the less it's going to weigh. If we want a heavier bullet, then we're going to make this punch stop, say, up here, and that's going to make for a longer body and therefore a heavier bullet. And that's how we can adjust the weight on the machine. But the same process every time. This, these two punches come together, they stop at a given distance, and the excess lead in between is bled out those holes. And that's how the whole swaging process works. So here we are in front of the high speed press. So this is where we're making all of our small bore slugs and why we're offering them at the uh, uh, price points we are offering them at now and why we can offer them in a much bigger bulk package than we were before. Uh, earlier we showed how we make the slugs uh, by hand in our, in our um, hydraulic machines. And then now we're gonna show it in the same type of process, 
put in a high speed version of this that's fully automated. You can hear it running here, and this is running all by itself with no input from the user. This is where the wire comes up through two wheels that are pulling the wire up to a certain uh, length. And that length is what determines the weight of the, of the blank coming in. So this first position, if you can see that in the camera, that wire is coming up, and when it gets to that, to that length, it then uh, the dial moves to the next position, and that cuts the wire off. There's a cutter inside right here. Then the next few positions, there's actually nothing happening. But when it gets to the very back, right back there where that punch is, that's where the die is. So that blank will drop down into the die, that punch will follow it, push it down into the die, force it through, and excess lead will be bled out the sides, just like it does in our manual hydraulic machines. Then it'll be pushed back up, and the dial will switch position, and that will pull the finished bullet over to the next slot, and a few, a few positions later, it will drop into this chute right here, and down into our finished bullet spin. Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm Nick's better half, and I take care of a lot of the processing of orders. What we do here is we have the orders come in via email or via our Shopify system, and then we see what's ordered and we package it up. If we have it ready-made from the high-speed machine, we just go pull that from the other room, package it up in these flat rate boxes, and then we print out the, the shipping label and mail it off in our mail room. Hi, I'm Greg Nielsen. I work for NSA. I'm Nick Nielsen's son, and I handle shipping and machining NSA bullets. So after we make our bullets on the high-speed press, we take a select amount of bullets, say it's 20, say it's 40. We put them on this counting scale. And after we got a select amount, you just type in the number. And it'll hold that weight, so that way when you put more bullets in, it's counting uh, each bullet as a single unit. So I just put in three more bullets, it was at 15, now it's at 18, and then uh, we put as many bullets as we put in, in our boxes on the scale, and that's how we make sure everyone gets the correct amount of bullets. Now we're going to grab a bag. And we will pour these bullets into said bag. We'll write down what they are, which they are... 218, 28.5 grains times 325. After we have our bullets counted and we put them in a bag, we put them in this bag so the bullets aren't loose. We put them in this foam. That way they don't get damaged. On top of that, we put them in a very thick box. That way they don't get damaged. After we put them in that, if there's any open space, we put another piece of foam. We close our box, grab it tight, get a piece of tape, and then we seal it shut. The last steps of this process is just grabbing a label, throwing it on the front, your NSA bullets are good to go. So I've noticed, you know, it's obviously a huge step, you know, people are, a lot of people are using your bullets. Mm -hmm. You've made it kind of a household name as far as air gun ammo. And kind of what do you think sets you apart from some of these other manufacturers? I'd say number one is I'm an air gunner first. Uh, ammo came second. I got into it because uh, I didn't like the ammo that I was able to buy. The, I didn't think the quality was there. Um, and the price points were pretty high and so I thought that there was uh, uh, really at first it was just a hobby it was just something in my garage I just started up um, I own another business I kind of had that business running really well and I had a lot of free time because my employees kind of ran it and so I just decided I want to start making my own ammo and then I wanted to uh, I actually I wanted to buy this machine right here but it's pretty expensive if you're just doing this for yourself so I started uh, to sell some of the ammo and slowly just started building up a you know bigger clientele um, at the time, I was only doing big bore. Then I started doing this, the small bore ammo, and that uh, really started opening up some, some doors for me as far as volume. Uh, now that we've got a lot of testing, a lot of years of, of testing a lot of different guns, a lot of different platforms, 
and a lot of customers that have been shooting our stuff for, for many years, um, we started getting into more automation, uh, building up our clientele even bigger, and now we're at a point where we're having a hard time keeping up, even with our automated machine. That's why we have a second one on order, and most likely that won't be our last machine. We'll have to continue to grow with it. So here we have our CNC machine. This is a mainly a lathe, but it also has milling capabilities. So it's got a lot of live tooling on here so we can uh, mill and drill from the sides or from the face of the part, uh, make all kinds of uh, interesting things. And the reason why we actually bought this, or at least the reason I told my wife, was because we need a way to make parts so that uh, we don't have these six to eight, sometimes 10 week lead times for simple things, even, even just punches, things that we need to run our, um, our high speed swage machine or uh, other machines that we use to make these bullets, we need some of our own capabilities so that we can make custom things, so we can do testing on uh, unique products that we want to make and not have to wait for these lead times. And so that's the main reason that we have it. Um, it also allows us to uh, kind of open up some other markets that you'll see uh, NSA offering here probably later in uh, 2020. Um, besides just, uh, just bullets, you'll probably see some other uh, products coming out from us. Um, and this is a machine that they'll be coming off and we'll kind of show you kind of some of the capabilities uh, that this machine does and, and the reason why we have it. And I think when you see it, uh, you'll see why we'll be able to come out with some pretty innovative things uh, coming out here in 2020. So this machine has got a 16 tool turret. So there's 16 different tools on there. Um, and even some of them can be doubled um, like this. This is a, a cutter to do OD work and it can cut on this spindle or this tool over here can cut on this spindle. So you can actually, theoretically, you could have even more. You could have 32 tools if you put them going each, each direction. Um, some of the things that this will do is, that makes this unique, is you have two spindles, your main spindle and a sub spindle. This spindle can actually come over and grab parts out of, out of the spindle over here, cut it off, bring it back over. The machine can then come down and, and finish the backside of the part. Um, there's a parts catcher here, you can catch the parts, have it uh, load into your, in your bin. Um, but one of the really unique things about it is the fact that besides having a sub spindle that can come over and grab the parts, it also have what, what's called live tooling. And I'll kind of show you what that means, if you're not familiar with that. So when we change tools over, and we, I can just kind of demonstrate what that means, it just means that the, the tool turret is going to rotate depending on what we want to do. So with the tool right here that is on there, that's going to uh, drill or mill, depending on what, what type of tool we put in there, and uh, onto the side of the part. If we change tools over to, say, this next tool, this is also a live tool. And live tool just means that this does the spinning. Just like a drill, this is going to do the spinning. This is not going to spin, and this is. So this is going to uh, go to the face of the part. And this can go either direction. When I turn this on, uh, this spins, but it spins on both sides. So I can go to the face of the part over here, or I can go to the sub spindle, and this one will cut over onto this side. So these two go in either direction, or these three go in either direction, either this one for this side, or this one to this side. Same with all three of these, where the other ones are for going on the side and drilling a hole through here, or milling a slot, or whatever you're going to do onto the side of the part. So we can do, we can make flats, we can do drills, we can uh, make pockets, anything that we want to do, and we can do that on either spindle. We can also take the spindle over and hold on to a, hold on to a part. This can walk over here, make sure I'm not going to run into anything, and this can grab onto this part, open up the, the chuck, grab onto this, it can pull it out. Both of them could be holding onto the part at the same time while we um, say mill onto a part where you get really good sturdy stability with that if you're holding onto it on both ends. And then it can cut off the part and then return back to its home position. And then when it, when it goes home, then this can come down and it can take care of the backside of the part so it spits out actually a finished part where no other machining would be required. Once we're done with the part, most of the time we're gonna anodize it if it's uh, aluminum. So here's a part that we made, uh, we just happen to Put this on the market a few days ago. This is a tool to take your gauge off of your Air Force gun, which I'm going to demonstrate to you. So we basically made this on this machine. Um, the machine that makes it a finished part. This is where like that milling comes into point uh, into play, where it's got that hole in the side. That's where it drills in from the side, uh, milling in the middle to get the on the face of the part to get it to be the exact shape of the gauge. 
And that's basically what this tool will do. So the reason I made this part is the last time I was fooling with it, I was trying to take it off and you can see it kind of took off the paint. I was tired of that happening. And so we made this tool and basically what this is gonna do is gonna fit right onto the gauge. It fits in there nice and slug with just the smallest amount of place you can get it on, but fits on there nice and tight so that it, it forms all the way around it. And if you need a little extra torque, there's a hole in there, you can put an Allen key or something in there and you can twist that and get that off of there with you. This is a family business for you. Yes. Your, your wife and your kids work here mm -hmm. as well as yourself. Yep. I would imagine that takes a lot away from family time. You guys spend most of your time here. Yeah, I'm here most days of the week. I'm here um, pretty much seven days a week. I'm here at least part of the day. Um, I try to take Sundays off if I can, um, but it's, it's just hard. We have to keep up. We, we want good customer service. It's really important to me. My other business is the same way. It's all about customer service. And we really try to um, maintain that uh, year round. Even when we get busy, we just put in a lot of hours and trying to get it done. You've got a lot of product in your catalog on your website. And I'm sure there are some products that you can make, but you mm -hmm. just don't offer yet on your site. And what would be one of the reasons that you wouldn't have it on there? It's mainly time. So there's only so much we can do. We're already here six or seven days a week. There's only so much time that we have on the presses, so much time that we can make blanks to get onto the presses. Um, our high-speed machine can only make so many of the bullets. The high-speed machine, it really has to be a, a caliber that is well, is well used so that it's worth the expense. Very expensive to tool up for even just one bullet. It's very, very expensive. Um, to tool up uh, for this isn't quite as bad, so that's why we have uh, more available for our hand machine, but it doesn't do the, the speed of the other machine. So there's kind of a balance. So we have to have enough shooters shooting that caliber. For example, we have 401, 408, 510. We have, these aren't even on our catalog. I have 338, 375. I can make them for myself, but there has got to be enough volume where it's worth me to set up the machines to make those bullets for these different guns. So part of it is just enough shooters out there. But some of these things are in my personal collection and I'll make them for myself or my friends, but they're not necessarily available to the public. What do you think is your number one selling bullet at the moment? Probably, um, I don't know if I can tell you what weight necessarily, but caliber wise I would say is 25 caliber is probably where we're doing the most volume. Um, although I would say 45 caliber for big bore is definitely our, our biggest seller. Um, the 350 grain boat tail bullet we sell is extremely popular, uh, as well as our 290 grain for, for deer hunting. And right now we're in deer season, it's November. And so there's a lot of people buying that ammo right now. I know a lot of people are not yet sold on shooting slugs out of their air gun. What would be a benefit to shooting a slug over a standard Diablo pellet? So probably the biggest difference is going to be when you're shooting in the wind. Uh, so if you're holding over, um, you know, three or four mil dots a, for a pellet, uh, a slug in the same wind shooting in the same gun, it may only be a one mil dot holdover. And so one thing that people got to realize is that uh, pellets, a Diablo pellet is extremely accurate. Um, so you could shoot groups really, really tight with them. But in real world hunting situations, when you're shooting out, let's just say 75, 100 yards, whatever it is, and you're shooting with a crosswind or a wind coming at you, whatever, you have uh, holdovers to, to take care of. The accuracy of that, if you're holding over this much in wind, well, you have that much air built into that shot. Yeah, when you have no no wind or little wind, and you could and you could uh, post groups up on you know the forums really really tight. Um, that's not realistic in real hunting situations. In real hunting situations where you got the crosswinds, where you don't have you know 20 different times that you can you can keep shooting and get that perfect group to take a picture of. You got one shot at whatever you're shooting at. So if you have this much holdover with a pellet and you have this much holdover with a slug, that's the error that's built into your shot. You have to compensate for that. So if you don't compensate enough then you're going to, you know, say you're, you're shooting in this direction, then you're going to miss it on this side. If you overcompensate, you go the other way. So if you have that much to compensate for, there's a lot of air built into every shot. You have to consider that, that just because your group is like this with a pellet and like this with a slug, in the wind, you have to compensate that much or that much. Which one, which one has more air? Obviously the pellet does. That's a big difference in shooting a slug versus a pellet, is that wind holdover. So the further the distance, the more the wind, the more that, that takes effect. Let's talk a little about barrels. I know there's a lot of different barrels floating around now. Mm -hmm. Is there kind of a general rule as to what 
works well, you know, in a specific barrel as far as slug. So the, the biggest problem with barrels is everybody really concentrates on twist rate. I mean, obviously twist rate is a factor, but really it's diameter. That's the problem that we have in the air gun industry is that there's no standards. When you're in the firearm business, you know, a 308 is, is 308. You know, there's standards in firearms. In the air guns, it's kind of a free-for-all. Um, you got, uh, you know, the U.S. made barrel might be a certain size. If it's a Korean made barrel, they're typically larger. And there, since there's no standard, it's very difficult for us to make bullets for them because the diameter is so important. You also have the difference in a non-choke barrel and a choke barrel. And I get a lot of emails about, can I shoot a slug in a choke barrel? And the answer is yes, you can, definitely, 100%. However, if you have an uh, extremely tight choke, it's probably not going to work because you have a, a, a barrel of a certain size and it's choked at the other end. So you, if you size it for the barrel, by the time it gets down to that choke, you are squeezing it so tight that you're just forming the bullet and it's not gonna work. If you have a light choke, that's gonna be fine, but you do have to size for the choke. You have to size for the smallest diameter, which is obviously gonna be the choke. So you can shoot in a choke barrel. However, your slug has to be sized for that choke. The reason why I prefer a non-choke barrel is if you, if you have a uh, bigger diameter at the beginning and then it comes through and it, and it hits the choke, that means you got some air bleeding by because you, you have a bullet that's too small for the barrel here, but the correct size for the choke. So if you use the same barrel length the whole way that doesn't have a choke, that way it's, uh, the bullet is sized for the entire barrel properly. That's why I prefer a non-choke barrel over a choke barrel, but you can shoot slugged through a choke barrel as long as you size the bullet for that choke. I know you offer a lot of different calibers. Is there anything new that you have coming out pretty soon? Uh, yeah. So in the for our high speed press, we do have 177 caliber on order. So uh, that's going to be probably beginning of 2020, maybe maybe January. Um, that's going to require testing, and you know, so it's, it's it's hard to say exactly when it'll come out. But assuming testing goes well, I would expect January 2020. Um, we would like to offer 20 caliber. We have a lot of people asking for it. It's not the most popular caliber, but we kind of like to be that one-stop shop where we kind of offer everything. Uh, we expect some more in 22 caliber, some other offerings that we don't currently have on the site. Uh, same with 25 and 30 caliber. We will be offering uh, 308 calibers also coming on our high-speed press. That doesn't so much change the pricing for us, but it, it, will, it, it will make our um, turnaround times much better so we can actually stock the things on the shelf, all the different calibers that we have, the different weights that we have, so that our wait time, right now, a lot of our big bore is done um, to order, most of it is, and so you might have to wait three or four days before we make it and then ship it out to you. Uh, we'd like to be able to shelve as much as we can, so our turnarounds are very, very quick. It also makes it easier for us to get it into the hands of dealers all around the world. We have a lot of dealers all around the world that are selling our ammo, but it does take us a while to make those orders for them because it's made by hand. What is involved in testing these bullets? So I have a pretty big collection of air guns. Uh, so I do a lot of the testing myself, um, but I don't have everything. And so I do have a group of uh, guys that we meet out at a uh, farm here in Southern California. And there's probably 10 or 20 guys that kind of show up at, at, at various days. And they'll bring their guns out there with them. And we'll shoot it through their guns. We'll shoot, uh, our standard is 100 yards, that's pretty much uh, what we're looking for. We, we want good groups at 100. If we can't get an inch or better at 100, we don't sell the bullet. Um, I like to do as much testing as I can myself, or at least be there when somebody else is testing it, because I like to see it with my own eyes. I don't really want cherry-picked groups. I want to make sure that, that it's not just one group that we got that that's good. That this bullet shoots well out of that gun, this gun, and that we can shoot it at different distances. Um, when, when you show 50-yard groups, it means nothing, it, because not all bullets will shoot good at 50 and then continue at, a, at 100 yards. A lot of bullets will shoot, especially in big board, a lot of bullets will shoot uh, good groups at 50 yards. At 100 yards, they start to open up. We've had bullets that shot really tight groups at 50 yards, and at 100 yards, you couldn't hit an 80-inch plate. So we don't obviously want to sell that. So 100 yards is pretty much our standard. Uh, we do shoot out two, three, 400 yards, but that's not for testing, that's more for fun. And, but we do like to make sure that the bullets are staying stable out there at those kind of distances as well. So if somebody's new to, they've never shot slugs, they're uh -huh. thinking about it, what would be something that they really need to, to know or think about before purchasing a slug? Well, I'd make sure that, uh, I would go on the forums, um, a lot of people ask, like, well, this gun or this gun shoot slug? We don't always know because we can't test every gun that's out there. 
I really suggest you go to the forums, go to the Facebook um, pages. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, the forums that I typically stay on to is Gateway to Air Guns, GTA, or Air Gun Nation. Both have, uh, they both have benefits, one or the other, depending on what, what kind of guns you have. And they have a lot of really talented people on there. Yeah, it's really good reading on there. You can, you can ask questions, people will help you. Um, and then the Facebook groups. The Facebook groups have a lot of different people and they're really specific. So for instance, if you're an uh, uh, Air Force guy, I, I love Air Force guns, and so there's uh, Facebook pages dedicated just to Air Force guns, uh, or for Ed Gun, or for uh, Day State Rifles. Whatever you're shooting, there's pages dedicated just for those guns. And you can ask, hey, I got um, you know, an, an Ed Gun, and uh, I got this caliber, this, this, this model, uh, what are you guys shooting out of the gun? You know, what do you find that are shooting? That way you're not wasting money uh, on slugs. If, if some guns won't shoot slugs, so you don't want to be wasting your money on that. We'll tell you, if we don't know, you email me and say, well, this, if I know that it doesn't, I'll say, don't waste your money on it, it doesn't yeah. shoot. Or I'll tell you, go to the forums, because I don't know the answer, and I don't want you to buy something. I don't want to guess. I want you to buy something that's really going to work in your gun. Well, Nick, I really appreciate you letting me visit your shop. I learned a lot. Definitely a lot going on here. I had no idea there there was this much involved as far as making ammo and this is definitely a really cool facility yeah, I thank appreciate you. you sharing it with me. Yeah, sounds Look good. Look forward to uh, seeing what you guys have going on in the next year. Sounds great.